Remember Ready Player One? That book slash movie about the guy who lives in the future and spends all his time in VR world? And there's a massive amount of references to the 80s? Or at least there were in the book. A lot of people have criticized the book because it panders heavily to people in the author's generation who grew up with stuff like Back to the Future, Rush's 2112 album, Pac-Man, etc. Personally, I think it's fine that he did this. I mean, the book really isn't that bad if you just view it as a bit of a self-insert fanfiction of the author's own life. Or like if you just read the book as the author's really long answer to the question, if you had complete control over what elements of popular culture received love and attention in the future, what kind of future would you build? Because that's all it is. And everyone loves to talk about stuff they like. Anyway, it'd be pretty hypocritical of me if I had any other opinion on the subject, seeing as how the rest of this video is pretty much going to be my own version of Ready Player One. At least in terms of inserting my favorite media into a creation of mine. So there's that. Except it's not a book, but a tabletop role-playing game. Right, so. This is a massive project that I've been working on, and I am nowhere near finished, just to make that clear. It may never even be finished, considering the amount of unfinished video scripts in my Google Drive and unfinished video files in my DaVinci Resolve. But I'm making this video to gauge audience reception, take suggestions, take criticism, and also just gush about some of my favorite video games and books and movies at the same time. I can do whatever I want. Actually, you know those scenes in movies where someone is writing a book and every time they have an idea for it, they take out like a tape recorder and talk into it? This video is a bit like that. I'm just talking out a bunch of ideas. Except also you guys can hear me and give me feedback on what would be cool and what would not be cool. This, my friends, is the world of Ruidia. Right off the bat, I named it Ruidia for a couple reasons. Part of it is drawn from the Latin word rudiment, which means element. And one of the big heavy themes I'm going for with this game is the 12 elements and their interactions with each other. You may recognize these elements and this picture right here because I never shut up about it. Also, Ruidia bears a strong resemblance to the word Ruidian, which is the name of a very cool location in the Wheel of Time series. Um, I'm only six books in, please don't spoil it. You'll notice a lot of references to Wheel of Time here and there. It's one of the biggest places I'm pulling from for inspiration and all. Anyway, Ruidia has a few important lore beats that I'm going to cover before anything else. Probably most often cited in the documents I've made so far is this event called the Erasure, or Erasure. Uh, which is an event that happened in recent history which completely annihilated almost all life across all the realms. I say recent history because I haven't decided exactly how long ago I want it to be, but I want it to be far enough in the past so that basically no one remembers it, but recent enough so that societies and cultures haven't had a lot of time to rebuild and develop. Oh yeah, there's also this thing called Origin. Origin is this intangible, omnipresent force that all living things are aware of. At least in Antaria, which is like the regular world. It's the source of all magic, and works a little bit like the true source in the Wheel of Time series, but not quite. Basically, anyone can sense its presence at any time and reach out to it to, like, cast magic. But a lot of people choose not to because they don't have the intelligence or skill to make good use of magic. It's also called different things in different cultures. Like, there's a race of people called the Terrans, who refer to Origin as the All-Mother. And there's another race, called the Skataxians, who refer to it as the Might Giver. I'm planning on there being all sorts of stuff like that. Oh my god, I haven't even gone over the races yet, this is gonna take a while. It's commonly understood by the people of Antaria that the erasure was caused by one guy, Vernac Solis, trying to tamper with Origin in some way. No one knows how or why, but whatever he did caused Origin to respond by wiping out almost all life and starting it up again with a few changes. Before the Erasure, people were just like you and me. I'm kind of planning on it being Earth. Anyway, these people from before the Erasure were constructed out of all 12 elements. But afterward, all sentient beings have to draw from only one element to exist and be alive, instead of all 12. This means that all people are basically elementals, in Dungeons & Dragons terms. I know that might sound messy to Dungeons & Dragons players, but I promise I'm going to make it work. Anyway, I haven't even talked about the elements themselves yet, so I'll do that now. First, we have light, which comes from the sun. Easy peasy. The people who are made out of light are called the Philuxians. 
a word derived from the Latin word lux, which means light, and the Greek word Phoebus, which is another name for Apollo, the god of light. I'm not going to go into too much detail, and those who are super interested in learning about the 12 races can just check out the documents in the description, but to boil it down to basics, the Philuxians are a race of kind of short people who are known for being very religious and wise and morally conscious. Think Azorius Senate, but without the mean people. Well, of course there's mean people in the government, but they usually aren't Philuxian, we'll say that. Moving on. Next up, we have the element of life. I know this is a little controversial and a lot of people wouldn't call life an element, but I like the idea of it being treated just like any other natural force. Like a regenerative healing power that flows through living things or something. So if you have a lot of it in your body, maybe your wounds heal quicker, and if you don't have enough of it, they won't heal very fast at all. That sort of thing. I'm also planning on having it set up to where most living things absorb life damage instead of being hurt by it, for obvious reasons. The people that are made from the element of life are called the Animians from the Latin word anima, which means soul, I think. These guys obviously have the longest lifespan, and they're bulky in terms of HP, but their culture also emphasizes emotional intelligence and art. The closest approximation for these guys I think would be a combination of the violets and the yellows from the Red Rising series, but I know that won't land with a lot of you, so think of it just like if there was a whole race of people that were doctors and therapists and musicians and basically nothing else. Okay, I'm gonna have to pick up the pace here. The element of ice is super straightforward. It's just ice and cold stuff. Easy. The Pagonians are the people made from ice. Also, now might be a good time to mention these people aren't literally made of ice. Their souls and bodies and stuff just draw from the element of ice and nowhere else. So, the elements are kind of just manifestations of origin, and when a person is created, they draw from one of those elements. So, the ice people have blue skin and white hair, and they're weak to fire damage, but they're still biologically just people with bones and blood and skin and stuff. Also, maybe their blood is blue. I think that would be neat. Uh, the word Pagonian comes from... The, I literally wrote the word uh in the script. What's wrong with me? The word Pagonian comes from the Greek word Pagos, which means ice. Culturally, they're communists. They're also militaristic, but like the cool kind of militaristic. Think of them as communist Spartans. Uh, right, next up, water. The water people are called Hydronians. They're basically the human manifestation of that one copy pasta about how you need a high IQ to watch Rick and Morty. They're a culture based on intelligence and knowledge, and they all probably would love Big Bang Theory. Also, they're very colorful with blue and green patterns on their skin, just because I think that's neat, and it, it differentiates them a little bit from the ice people. The earth people are interesting, I think. They're very tall and large, but they're a lot more focused on spirituality and meditation. I made them kind of like Buddhists. Also, they're matriarchal, and the female members of their species are bigger and stronger than the men. I just wanted to have at least one culture that was ruled by women in this world, just because I think having something like that offers a lot of plot hooks and in-story conflict between other civilizations. Next up, we have another pick that might be a little bit controversial, the element of metal. I'm planning on it being sourced from ore and stuff underground, obviously but also magnetism and bones. Yeah, in this world, bones are made out of metal elemental energy. Pretty cool, right? The metal people are extremely political, and their cultural values include order and diplomacy, and pretty much anything political related. Think super complicated bureaucratic governments and civil power struggles constantly. Oh yeah, also they're called the Astalians, which comes from the Greek word for steel, astali. All right, halfway there. The Skotaxians are super cool, in my opinion. The name comes from Skotadi, the Greek word for dark, but I added an X, because Xs are cool, according to Elon Musk, anyway. They come from the element of darkness, which is sourced from the moon and also dark places like caves. I wanted all the other races to blame them somehow for the erasure, citing the fact that maybe Vernax Solis was a Skotaxian. But obviously this couldn't have been true, since the elemental races didn't exist before the erasure. Anyway. This has caused the Skotaxians to be ostracized from most societies, and they usually have to hide their identities if they want to fit in, or just become lawless bandits or thieves. Of course, they're just like everybody else, with their own flaws and virtues and everything, but it's society that's keeping them down. Yes, I put racism in my TTRPG, what are you going to do about it? Next up, we have another pick that might be a little controversial, the opposite of the element of life, which is the element of death. So, yes, death is an element and also a damage type. 
and the death elemental people are vulnerable to life damage instead of absorbing it, and they instead absorb death damage. I know, I know, but I promise I'm gonna find a way to make this work. If you have any cool ideas, please comment below. <laughs> anyway, the people that are constructed out of the element of death are called the Ethorians. It used to be Forthorians, from the Greek word for decay, but I didn't like how it sounded, so I put an E there. The Ethorians are obsessed with strength and battle, and bloodshed. They're kind of like the Florins from Starbound, a little bit, only more civilized and not made of plants. Also, the element of death itself is like life in that it's just sort of a cosmic force that flows around and if too much of it collects, that's what causes people to die. It generally concentrates around decomposers like fungi, worms, and even rats and vultures and stuff. And also just dead organic tissue. Perfect for necromancy. Fire is the next element. Obviously it's the opposite of ice, but that doesn't make them capitalists. <laughs> Instead, the Infernians are individualistic and expressive. They spread out, go everywhere, and do everything. They're a bunch of unique rebel types. Also, I made their lifespan 40 years. You know, because they burn out quickly. Next up is the Tenitrians, the Thunder People. Their name comes from the Latin word for thunder. These guys are like physically perfect. I wanted to make them a race of perfect, attractive, athletic, sporty types to counter the Hydronians' obsession with knowledge and more mental activities. Anyway, they're big and strong and everything and their culture is heavily focused on sports. Basically, I was kind of thinking about Blitzball from Final Fantasy X when I was writing their little blurb in the documents. Up next, we've got Wind. I love these guys. They're called the Uranians, which is derived from the Greek word Uranos, which means sky. I wanted them to be travelers and nomads mostly, so I drew inspiration from the Tuatha'an from Wheel of Time, or the traveling people. A group of people that travel the world and spread peace and love and stuff. Only the Uranians I've created are less strict and more free-spirited. I wanted them to be entirely neutral or ambivalent in stuff like politics and religion. You know, to counter the harsh societal customs and traditions of the Terrans. Alright, last one. The Phytonians are plant people. Guess what language their name comes from. These guys are a little bit like satyrs in classic mythology. They love partying and drinking and making friends more than anything. They're not known to be super intelligent, and obviously their opposite is the Astalians, the metal people. So they don't spend a lot of time thinking or plotting about how they rule the world or whatever. They're also green and photosynthetic. And those are the 12 races of Antaria. For now, I'm going to be making it so you can only play as one of these 12, but maybe in the future I'll add ways to play as a demi-human or a construct or something. Also, now sounds like a good time to address this. I'm not describing to you how every member of a race is. Obviously, if you want to play this game and make a character that's a Tenitrian, that character doesn't have to be involved with sports or even have to be all that athletic. It's just something that Tenitrian culture values. I'm just laying out all these societies that believe in these certain things and value certain ideas, and you can play around in them with characters and stories however you want. For example, maybe you have a Phylluxian character, that's the religious light people, who actually hates the idea of religion and chooses to travel to a Hydronian city to study with scholars where they fit in. Or maybe you want to play as an Ethorian healer, or an Astalian druid. You can do whatever you want, except there technically aren't druids. Anyway, this has been going on for long enough. I think it's time to move on to the next topic. All right, that section was a little longer than expected, but now I feel like a lot of the things I was inspired by are gonna shine through with how this game works. First, the characters all have stats pretty similar to D&D in a lot of ways. There's strength, intelligence, vitality, spirit, agility, and luck. But there's one pair of stats that I'm planning on making a very central mechanic of the game. I'll get to that in a second. Strength and intelligence determine how much damage you do with either physical or magical attacks, respectively. And vitality and sp oh, I bit my tongue. And vitality and spirit reduce your damage taken from physical or magical attacks, respectively. These four stats are very basic and simple, kind of like Pokemon. Agility is for stuff like turn order and evasion, and luck is for critical hits, status effects, success rate, and pretty much everything else that doesn't really fit anywhere. But check this out, I saved the last two stats for last because I think they're really cool. Bravery and Faith You might recognize these from Final Fantasy Tactics, 
And yes, I am sort of stealing them from Final Fantasy Tactics, but I've done some stuff to it. We'll go over bravery first. Bravery is a representation of a character's courage and willingness to physically fight. People naturally have a bravery of 10, but it can be reduced to 0 or increased to 30 over the course of a battle. In terms of actual attacks and combat, the way it works is you're more likely to land your physical attacks if you have high bravery, but you're also more likely to get hit by other physical attacks. If you have low bravery though, you won't land your attacks very often, but you'll also avoid them more often. And I also have it set up to where if you get hit with a particularly strong physical attack, your bravery will go down. And if you land a particularly strong attack, your bravery will go up. It's supposed to be a very fluid number, like HP or something. So each character has a base bravery that they start battle with, and then maybe it'll change over the course of the battle. Faith is very similar to bravery, except it deals with magical attacks. It's a representation of how much a character believes in magic, so if they don't believe very much, they'll have a higher chance of being unaffected by magical effects. I thought about it affecting healing spells, like it does in Final Fantasy Tactics, but I decided to just keep it as simple as possible with how this stuff works. I'm planning on having it affect certain status effects though, and one of the skill checks based on a character's faith stat is even called belief. Anyway, the system so far is going to be based on using a D100 for pretty much everything, with skill checks and attack rolls and the like all being roll under. So like for example, if you attack something with a sword, and the sword has a hit score of 60, then you'll hit your target as long as you roll anything 60 or below. Obviously, stuff like your bravery and their agility and maybe even their vitality might come into play, but I'll talk more about the specifics of combat some other time. Aside from all that, I also have a myriad of classes that I've stolen from other games. I really wanted to emulate the way Xenoblade 3 has the offense-defense support balance thing going on, so I've divided the classes into those three categories. I want everything to balance out so that a party needs at least one offense character, one defense character, and one support character. But that's turning out to be really hard, and it'll probably be a while before I get everything figured out in that regard. Also, I plan on there being lots and lots of overlap between these, so there will be classes that straddle the divides between them. Like the Valkyrie, for example, who excels at protecting teammates but also has access to healing magic. Or the Assassin, who deals lots and lots of physical damage but also has abilities that inflict negative status effects and mess with terrain, maybe. A lot of these classes come directly from other games, Provided I've changed the abilities, obviously, and a lot of that is because there are some really neat ideas that I feel don't get enough attention in other TTRPGs. Like, a lot of JRPGs, namely Bravely Default or Final Fantasy VIII, have a Dark Knight class that spends HP like currency in order to deal damage and deal special effects. Or the Time Mage from Final Fantasy Tactics, who has access to haste and slow and all the regular stuff, but also meteors. I think giving the Time Mage's space theme spells was a really cool idea, and it doesn't really get explored in things like 5e or, I don't know, Palladium? I'm gonna be totally honest. I don't think my computer can handle rendering a video any longer than this, so I'll start wrapping up here. I have a lot more to say about this passion project of mine, and hopefully if you're still listening it means you're interested. Please let me know. I put a link to the table of contents page in the description, but I update and change things nearly every day, so I'm sure by the time this video is out it'll already be outdated. Also, it'll be glaringly obvious that I have no experience writing tabletop role-playing games uh, when you read through those documents. I'm working on learning about it but I want to get all my ideas laid out and worry about how the actual parts move later on. Alright, I think it's about that time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.